Hello everybody, in today's video we're looking at a 2009 diesel Honda Accord. In any normal scenario, this should actually be an extremely popular car. In fact, for 2009, this really should have been one of Honda's best-selling products. After all, on the face of it, it does a lot right. It has a reasonably torquey, if not especially powerful, 2.2-litre iDTEC diesel engine. Allegedly, one of Honda's finest diesel power plants, and with far fewer problems than the CDTI that they made. It's a pretty good looking car too and has more than a whiff of my old Saab 9.3 about it and that is only a good thing when it comes to the looks. It's got a bit of a low slung front to it, it's fairly aggressive but not overly so and I think it's actually something of a looker. Here in black it's reasonably stealthy and I think it's the sort of car that should do really a bit of everything. It is, as you might expect, front-wheel drive, but here in normal Carsville, that actually has its own benefits because it means that the boot is very large indeed. Fuel economy is also excellent with figures in excess of 70 miles to the gallon not unattainable and between 50 and 60 very achievable as a realistic average. So why then is it that this car never really found an audience when it was new? Price almost certainly had a part to play. In the eyes of many British people, you'd compare a Honda with something like, say, a Vauxhall. However, this was priced more like a BMW. One of these new would have set you back about 30 odd thousand pounds, putting it directly in the firing line of such cars as BMW's then relatively new E90 3 Series. To sit in it, it's all right. This is certainly not a premium car if you're used to your BMWs and so on and so forth. It's a very familiar place to be if you've had the pleasure of any Honda of the time. The dash has a few lights I recognise from the FN2 and others. The dials are obviously bespoke to the Accord. This sat-nav screen here is hilariously out of date and the steering wheel also feels very familiar. The gear knob here is actually lifted straight from the S2000. Now that's not entirely standard. The regular item is pretty much an S2000 knob, just without the perforated leather on it. This one is slightly modified, as you may expect any Honda owned by a 23 year old to be. It's been dropped down onto some BC Racing RS coilovers. Means it has a pretty good stance, but unfortunately, it also means that down my favourite test route, it does like to scrape along a bit. As far as I'm concerned, it's far, far too low to have real fun in on the sort of roads that I enjoy. The gearbox itself is quite nice to use, although in typical diesel fashion, the first couple of ratios are actually pretty short. The engine sounds pretty smooth too. Some diesels of this period were quite gruff, but this little ID tech actually doesn't sound that terrible. Should your heart desire, you can also rev match too, although it's not the sort of car where you naturally want to do that. Visibility is a bit of a mix. Uh, forwards and to either side is pretty good. Uh, the rear, not so great, mostly because this has a fairly serious tent on the back window, and um, for the same reason, rear three quarters is uh, less than ideal. That's not really the car's fault, more just how this individual one has been set up. It's a reasonable size, and I'd say you'd get four normal adults in here just about, but as with many saloons, it's not quite as capacious for passengers as you might think that it should be. Honda did actually make a fruity Type S version of the Accord, which unusually also used the diesel engine. There was a prototype Mugen vehicle, but it never unfortunately made production. Even the Type S wasn't especially powerful, and the regular car would put out about 150 horsepower, not really a lot. This one has been modified just a little bit, and now puts out around 190 with over 300 pound-feet of torque. Not exceptional figures, but enough to pull you down the road. And by Honda standards, there are some very nice upmarket features in this car. You have dual zone climate control, you have heated seats, and those same seats are also fully electric. They've made an attempt to bring the interior a bit upmarket with this sort of woody stuff in here, but it's not really worked all that well. Also, contrary to popular belief, these are not bulletproof cars. There are a few small issues that you want to be aware of. Rear calipers are known to stick on. There is an EGR pipe, which is known to crack. And if you do want to lower the car, you need to make sure to accommodate that at the rear. Because if you leave the suspension as standard, you're going to have some very unusual toe and camber settings. So if you buy one of these and find yourself chewing through tyres at an alarming rate, that's probably the cause of it. 
You may have also noticed that this one is wearing some unusual badges, because its owner Matt has decided he likes the look of the Acura TSX, the American domestic market model, which is essentially the same as this. Uh, he's managed to import through Talk GT a few little bits for the car, including the front grille, and I have to say, it gives it a very cool look. I think it's one of those little things that you can do to a car and actually really does lift it for me. I don't have any problems with the Honda badge, but the Acura badge is the kind of thing I think that's going to get a smile from a knowing petrol head. One of the most bizarre things about the dash is that they have dedicated an unusually large amount of it to the gear shift indicators. Now these are a legal requirement these days, but quite why Honda felt to give half of an entire dial to the up and down bit that literally nobody ever has paid any attention to, I do not know. Other issues you might face with this car in 2020 include the fact that if you do want to upgrade the infotainment, because of the way Honda did it from the off, it is somewhat difficult to install a doubled-in head unit and not still have this thing sat here essentially doing nothing. It's one of these things that you'll find in common with a lot of cars in this time period, but it would just annoy me if you had a screen sat there just off all the time. This certainly doesn't have anywhere near the pace of my Saab, and I have to say I think that car actually felt a little nicer inside, felt a little bit slicker, but there's nothing particularly wrong with the Honda. This is a nicer driving experience, albeit a touch too low. It's actually pretty comfortable, it has to be said, and it's obviously a car that's designed more for cruising than for B-row blasting. These seats are actually pretty nice and support you more than you think that they might. All of the controls also are nicely weighted, the steering is decent if not excellent and the same goes really for the brakes throttle and the clutch it's a very easy car to drive i think it is unfortunate that there was never a hot type r version of this car but in truth the accord's failings never really seem to be that of the car itself in some of honda's key marketplaces europe and japan the saloon car itself is something of a dying breed particularly here in britain and europe the hatchback really has killed off the saloon. Well, the hatchback and more accurately, the silly crossover SUV. I'm pretty confident Honda probably sold more CRVs than they did Accords. And that is a shame really, because there's nothing really especially wrong with a saloon car. You can see four people, it's got plenty of room, it's nice and efficient, it's decent to drive, it's good to look at too. This suspension is definitely a weak point in the car. It can go round a bend, but it's not very happy about it. It is quite bouncy and floaty, and there isn't an awful lot of body control in here. The car's got enough grip, there's no differential in here, and apparently it's almost certain that there aren't any out there that will actually fit the ID.Tech engine and its gearbox. There are diffs which will fit the CDTI, and there's a chance that it might also work with this, but I don't believe anyone's actually found out yet. It is always, though, for me, quite nerve-wracking when you're driving a car along a road, knowing that it might tap the deck, because that is something you really want to avoid. I think this could do with actually being raised up somewhat and perhaps stiffened just a little. But then, I'm old and boring, you see. This is the sort of thing that a young person should probably have. A nice, imperfect car. It's brisk enough, the engine pulls fairly smoothly to about 4,000 RPM. Never really going to excite you. But it's got a decent spread of power, and actually for normal driving duties, it's probably a lot better than any of the Type R's you'd find at this kind of price. And that is one of the best bits about this car. They are pretty cheap to buy now. You can pick one up from, say, about £3,000, although it is debatable as to how good that particular car might be. But honestly, if you're looking for just a, a normal, decent car that you can use for a bit of everything, you probably could do worse than this. If you are a young driver too, one of the good things about buying a car like this is that your insurance is not going to be too bad. Its owner is 23 with five years no claims, no points, and he pays about 500 odd quid for his insurance, which is a lot less than the Civic that he used to have, albeit that was a quite modified car. That doesn't surprise me though, because at his age I was driving around in a V8 BMW and paying a lot less for insurance than I later paid for on a 1.4 diesel van. That is the weird way that insurance companies work, so while you can, take advantage of it. But anyway, that is the 8th generation Honda Accord ID.Tech EX GT. Thanks to Matt for bringing it along, thanks to you for watching, please like, comment below, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you all for the next one. Bye bye.